Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> the sermon today is Jesus rejects Pharisees' demand for a sign. And the sermon text will be Mark 8, 10 through 13. And I'm also going to read Matthew 16, 1 through 4, because it's a parallel passage, the same, talking about the same incident, but with a little more detail, which will help us. Matthew 16, verses 1 through 4, will be the additional passage I will read. But first, Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 10. This is, this is after now that Jesus fed the 4,000 and verse 10, straight away he entered into a ship with his disciples and came to the parts of Dalmanutha. And the Pharisees came forth and began to question with him, seeking of him a sign from heaven tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek after a sign? Truly, I say to you, there shall no sign be given to this generation. And he left them, and entering into the ship, again departed to the other side. Now I'm going to, to Matthew 16, starting in, in verse 1, 1 through 4. The Pharisees, also with the Sadducees, came and tempting him, that is, trying him, trying to prove him wrong, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, because the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and threatening, or overcast. O oh, you hypocrites, you can discern you can interpret the face of the sky, but can you not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. So here, here, we get, here we get the picture from two different accounts. They're the same. It's just that, that Mark doesn't include all of the words that Jesus spoke. That wasn't his purpose. But we do have Matthew, who also recorded it and gave us some of the extra information that helps in understanding this. When Jesus shows up, it looks like they've been waiting for him. They want to try and, and catch him. This is a regular occurrence now to show that he is a false prophet or that he does something wrong so that they can charge him and put him to death. The Pharisees were those who were very strict about man-made laws, the traditions of men, but not the word of God. And the Sadducees were, we'd call them skeptics. They didn't believe in the supernatural. 
They confront him and demand a sign from heaven so that they might catch him. The thing is that Jesus has been showing signs from heaven, mighty signs, and when, they, when, when these Pharisees see the mighty signs, raising the dead, casting out demons, they say, you do these works because you have the spirit of the devil in you. So it doesn't matter what he does, even when he does show mighty signs, they still find reason to accuse him. And on that occasion, when they said, you do these works by the spirit of Beelzebub, the devil, he warned them, he said, all sins will be forgiven to the sons of men, men and women, all sins will be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Because that's what they were doing. They were saying, the spirit that is in you is the spirit of the devil. And that's blasphemy. He said, there is never forgiveness for that sin. Be warned, be aware. What Jesus is saying to them, no sign shall be given to you except prophet, that of the prophet Jonah. Jonah was three nights swallowed by the great fish under the sea, in the water, in the belly of the fish. Three nights down in the belly of hell, Jonah called it. And he prayed, and the whale spit him out on the land. Meaning that Jesus would be three nights in the grave. And he would be raised again to life. But Jesus says to them, no sign such as you are demanding shall be given to you. They wanted to see a mighty work. But when a mighty work was shown to them, they blasphemed God. Get the picture. Here are these teachers Jesus shows up back in the area where they live and they've gathered together to confront him, to oppose him. These are, are the, the teachers of the people, supposedly. They could tell the weather. They could tell when it was going to be a nice day in the morning or it would be a bad day with rain and, and storms. But they could not see the sign of the times. This is a very important phrase, the sign of the times. What were the signs of the times that they couldn't see, that they would not see because of their hatred? These are some of the works that Jesus did. Healings. He did miraculous healings so that people would seek him out. Great crowds of people. They knew about these things. Raising the dead. He raised the dead on a number of occasions. He raised Jairus' daughter. He raised, a little later on, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Casting out demons. These were powerful, powerful demons, and people were afraid of the demon possessed, as we have seen in a previous sermon. He could do these things. He calmed great storms that, were, that would have killed, that would have capsized and sunk a boat and likely killed the people on the boat, the disciples, with a word. The wind stopped. The waves became calm. 
And they were amazed. Who is this? Who can do this? He fed great multitudes of people with just having a few loaves of bread on two occasions. One, 5,000 plus women and children, and another 4,000 plus women and children. A mighty miracle. They had to know of these things, these Pharisees that were accusing him. But they hated him. They didn't want to give him any credit whatsoever. So, what, what sign was it that they, that they were not seeing? Jesus had come into the world to teach about the kingdom of heaven and how to enter it and proclaim the love, mercy, and undeserved favor of God the Father who sent him. This was a new development in the history of humankind. The world had been, since the fall of Adam, filled with devils, filled with enemies of the people of God. The great nations conquering smaller nations, misery and suffering and death. Sickness, diseases, demon possession. But here comes Jesus Christ announcing the kingdom of heaven and backing it up by these mighty works. It's easy, easy to kill somebody. You just take a gun or a knife or a, a club. But it's impossible to raise people from the dead. Who could do that? But God or a prophet of God. We have prophets of God in the Old Testament that were able, after they prayed to God, to raise the dead. But here comes one who by the word of his mouth, by the power of the Spirit in him, raises the dead. A new age had dawned. From beginning with the word spoken in the Garden of Eden, that the seed of the woman, from the line of Eve, one would come who would crush the serpent's head, the devil's head. The devil would bruise his heel, a, not a fatal injury. And, and from one child down through the generations would come the Savior of the world. Put an end to the suffering put an end to death. Has, has Jesus Christ not put an end to death? He has. Those of you who have loved ones that belonged to Jesus Christ that have died, they live. They live in the presence of God even now as I talk. I have friends that are in the presence of God he abolished death, the Lord Jesus Christ. The sign of the times spoke this. A new age has dawned, an age of life, an age of blessing from God, an age that was prophesied by the prophets beginning with beginning with Eve and up through the, the, the thousands of years he would come Messiah would come the godly Jews waited for this and longed for this 
They lived. They hungered. They thirsted to see Him, to be blessed by Him. Human history itself was entering its final stage. Think of this. We are in what's called the last days. Technically speaking, the last days are the days of Christ. Beginning with Christ coming into the world, being born, living, dying on the cross, rising from the dead. This is the beginning of the last days. That's what the Bible calls it. The 2,000 years past are still part of the last days. We, here now in 2023, are in the end of the last days. What these, what these Pharisees, who did not have a heart for God, although there were some that did, Nicodemus was one of them, what they could not see was that the messianic kingdom had arrived and it would be a whole new order of worship instituted. We don't have to go to a temple. We don't have to be in a building. We can worship in the fields, in the forests. Some of our people in areas of Nigeria, in, in parts of Africa, they worship in the jungle. It's safe. They have their private places where they can go and worship, and there, no Muslims will come and attack them. We can worship in an apartment. We can worship on a bench. We can worship anywhere. And where two or three of us are gathered together, God is present in our midst. Yes, when we're alone, He's present in our hearts. But there's a special blessing when at least two or three are gathered together. Jesus made this promise. They were blind to it. We, we are blessed because we're not blind. He has given us sight. He has given us faith. You have His Word. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you are one of the blessed. It doesn't matter your station in life. It doesn't matter that there are rich and famous people and we all of us here, I would say, we're, we're all pretty poor. It doesn't matter your station in life. You are blessed. You are beloved of God, the God of heaven. You are richer. You will see. You, you might say, I'm just talking. I'm just talking religious stuff. But listen, you will see it with your own eyes. You will have glory and wealth that you can't even imagine when the kingdom of God comes and you find yourselves in it. I want to read you a, a passage here about the last days. And the last days the last 2,000 years, but getting worse at the end. Keep it in mind. This is from 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm reading in the New Living Translation. The, the NLT, it's called. The New Living Translation. The dangers of the last days. This is Paul writing to Timothy. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God, disobedient to their parents, and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. 
They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that could make them godly. Stay away from people like that. That's 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. You see why I like this. The, I like the King James, but it makes it very clear and simple, easy to understand. Here's, here's another passage good for us in these last days from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verse 15. No, I'm going to start with verse 17. Every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. That is like poisonous fruit or, or uh, bitter fruit. Every tree that brings forth not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Verse 20. Therefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. If somebody says, I'm a Christian, and they are cursing, they can't control their temper, they are violent in their language. You know them by their fruit. Keep it in mind. What are, what are the signs of our times? This is the application. What are the signs of our times? Really, they, they differ in different countries and in different regions. The, the sign of the times that evil is getting worse and the sky is darkening for those that are Christians in Nigeria, it's Islam and the growing terror. That's a sign of the times. It wasn't always so in Nigeria. This is a recent development. You're going back 20, 30 years ago, it wasn't like this. In, in Cameroon, war, civil war, evil men. In America, it's different. The, the signs of the time in America, recently, they had Somebody, I don't know how, how familiar you are with some of the things going on in, in Europe and in America and in England. They have transgender people, which is women saying, I'm a man. And they'll take hormones, they'll mutilate their bodies so that they don't have the female organs. Or Men saying, I'm a girl. It's crazy stuff. And, and this is, you don't see much of it here. This is a very conservative country. But in Europe and the UK and America, New Zealand, supposed civilized West. And just last week, a woman, 28-year-old woman, she said, I'm a man. I want to be a man. I should have been a man. She had gone to a Christian school when she was young, and she had a hatred for Christians because Christians said, God determines 
what gender you are, whether you're born male or female, God determines that at your birth. And the trans community hates that because they say, I'll be God to myself. This God says that I can't do, I can't be what I'm not. A man can't be a woman. We hate that, that God and the people who teach that. She went into, this, into a school, a Christian school, with, with two rifles and a pistol. She started shooting them up. She killed three children and three teachers. Fortunately, the police were quick getting to her, and they shot her before she could kill more. She had two rifles and was going to empty them and kill a lot more. But still, three children and three of the staff in the school, they were shot dead. And the news in America is saying, these Christians, they deserved it because they're teaching, the news was saying this, they're teaching that God determines who's a male and who's a female. We don't like that anymore. We don't agree with that. There, there is a madness in the mind going on in the West. Like I said, you don't see it here except on the news, on the internet. That's a sign of the times. There is a madness in America. One of, one of the, the government-funded radio programs, National Public Radio, NPR, said, you trans people need to buy more guns to defend yourselves, but nobody's been going after them. What they're saying is, put some fear into the Christians. Make them stop what they're saying. But we're not gonna do that. But we don't have that here in Cyprus. You don't have that kind of craziness in Nigeria or in other parts of Africa. Sign of the times. In in the EU and in the UK, Islam is growing. And they're not waging jihad with weapons, they're waging jihad by babies. The, the Europeans, they don't like to have a lot of children. The Islamists, they have many wives and they have, they, one family can have 10, 15 children. People are saying, rightly so, in maybe 20 years, if the world lasts that long, Europe will be Muslim. More Muslims than Europeans. And, and the politicians who allow them into the country, oh, we like these, these Muslims, they're, they're good people, even though they ought to know they're killers, and they won't assimilate. They won't be part of your country. They, their, their teaching is, take it over. Take over the country. The sign of the times. These are signs of our times. Cruelty. We read here from 2 Timothy. Lack of love. Ferocity. Pride. People saying, I'm better than you. The, the lower class people, I look down on the low class. I'm big. Puffed up is what the, the scripture calls it. I am puffed up. Signs of the times. The, the application for our lives. And this will be this will be fairly short, the application, but take it to heart because it's important. I'm going to read very briefly from Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 27. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. 
and a little earlier than that, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. And we have Jesus talking about this yoke in, in Matthew 11. He says, Come to me, all you that, heavy, that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew 11, 28, 29, and 30. My yoke is easy. What is the yoke? It is the, 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 the gentle and easy disciplines that God puts upon his people. The disciplines. You're disciples. You are disciplined people. You, you discipline yourselves. You control yourselves according to God's Word with the Holy Spirit helping you. You do what is right. What is the yoke? Jesus says, My yoke is easy, my burden is light. It's His Word. That's his yoke. Learn his word. Study his word. Get to know it. Listen, I told you folks that our disciples of Jesus read through the Gospel of John. It's a good exercise. Read through the Gospel of John. I don't think you were here maybe when I said that. I was here. I, I used to read. So. Good, good. That's how, that's how we grow. By, this is the yoke. Okay, it's a big book. I agree. It might take you a while to read through it. But do it. I've read through it a number of times. And when I get to the end, I start again. And some I read more than others. This book will give you wisdom that, such that you will be able to get successfully to the kingdom of heaven. I won't be here forever. I'm an old guy. You, you men and women here, you're young. But remember these words. Get to know your Bible. It's your life. It is life to you. Remember that I said that. Okay, know the words of your God. Live a life close to Him. Well, if you know your word, you'll know that He has made a promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Matthew 28, verse 20. I, I remember them because I live by them. I am with you always, even till the end of the world, or the end of the age. Promises. His promises. We live by His promises. Walk close to Him. When you have trouble, when you have a problem, Lord, I'm in trouble. I need help. You know, you know a passage you can turn to right away? Psalm, Psalm 46, for example. Young, you like the Psalms, so you have a lot of these little prayer helps in your, in your memory. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. A very present help in trouble. When temptation comes, Lord, help me. This is bigger than me. This, this is too much for me. I'm not strong enough. Jesus said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. At, at 81 years old, I really am weak. I don't have the strength I used to have. I used to be a strong young man. 
but no more. I'm not strong. I have to depend on you young men to do the heavy work around here. My strength is made perfect in your weakness, Jesus said to Paul and to all of us. Live close to him. Go to him. When something comes up, ask the Lord for help. Lord, help me. Give me understanding. And lastly, be joined to a church family. Be joined to a church family. Wherever you are, whatever country you're in, even if it's maybe three or four people, where, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. A promise of Jesus Christ. We need each other. I have certain gifts and ability to help, which I do. You all, individually, have certain gifts and ability to help, and you do. Help one another out. We're in a hostile world, getting more hostile and more dark. When you want to move to a certain city, say, or you want to move to a certain area, number one, number one on the list, is there a good church nearby? Okay, sometimes you can't help it if your company moves and you have to move. But if you can help it, where is there a church nearby? A friend of mine was moving out to California in America. I said, is there a good church near you? He says, help me find one. So I did. I, I wrote to some of my friends, what's a good church in this city? And he's in a good church. It's so important. Be around other people of God. They can help you, pray for you. If you're hungry, give you food, shelter. Know the word of God. Live a life close to him. Be joined to a church family. Those three things. Let's pray. Thank you for your mercies, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we are living in an age near the end. The end of this age, Lord. Be with us to strengthen us and, and give your men and women wisdom and heart and understanding. Thank you for your great love toward us. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.